Elon Musk, great to see you. How are you? Uh, good, how are you? I mean, we're here at the Texas Gigafactory the day before this thing opens. It's been pretty crazy out there. Thank you so much for making time. Hey, welcome. Busy day. I would love you to help us kind of cast our minds, I don't know, 10, 20, maybe 30 years into the future. And, and help us try to picture what it would take to build a future that's worth getting excited about. You've often said it, the last sure. time you spoke at TED, you said that that was really just a big driver. It's, you know, you talk about lots of other reasons to do the work you're doing, but fundamentally, you want to think about the future and not think that it sucks. <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. I think in general, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of discussion of, of like this problem or that problem, and a lot of people are uh, <clears throat> sad about the future. And, and that they're uh, pessimistic, and and I think uh, <clears throat> this is this is uh, this is not not great. I mean, we we really want to wake up in the morning and and look forward to the future. We want to be excited about uh, what's going to happen, mm. um, and um, and and life cannot simply be about uh, sort of solving one miserable problem after another. So if you, if you look forward 30 years, you know, this year, tw the year 2050 has been labeled by scientists as this kind of, almost like this doomsday deadline on climate. There's a, there's a consensus of scientists, a large consensus of scientists who believe that if we haven't completely uh, eliminated greenhouse gases or, or offset them completely by 2050, effectively we're inviting climate catastrophe. Do you believe there is a pathway to avoid that catastrophe, and what would it look like? Yeah, yeah. So, um, I am not one of the doomsday people, which may surprise. Uh, I, I actually think we're on a good path, um, I, I, but at the same time, I, I want to want to caution against complacency. So, so long as we are not complacent. As long as we are have a high sense of urgency about moving towards a sustainable uh, energy economy, then I think things will be fine. Mm. Um, so I, I can't emphasize that enough. As long as we uh, push hard uh, and are not complacent, um, the, the future is going to be great. Don't worry about it. Like, I mean, worry about it. But if you worry about it, ironically, it will be a, a self unfulfilling prophecy. Um, so. Like there, there, are, there are three elements to a sustainable energy future. Uh, one is obviously sustainable energy generation, uh, which is primarily wind and solar. Uh, there's also uh, uh, hydro, uh, geothermal. Uh, I'm actually pro-nuclear. Uh, uh, I think I think uh, nuclear is fine. Um, and um, uh, but it's going to be primarily solar and, and wind as the, uh, the the primary generators of energy. The second part is you need batteries to, uh, to store uh, the solar and wind energy because the sun doesn't shine all the time, the wind doesn't blow all the time. Mm. So you need uh, a lot of stationary battery packs. Um, and then you need uh, electric transport. So electric cars, electric planes, boats, and then uh, ultimately, uh, you, you, it's not really possible to make electric rockets, but you can make the propellant uh, used in, in, in rockets uh, using sustainable energy. Right. So. Uh, ultimately, we can have a fully sustainable energy e economy, uh, and um, and it's, it's those three things: solar, wind, uh, stationary right. battery pack, electric vehicles. So, so then, uh, what, what what are the limiting factors on progress? The limiting factor really will be uh, battery cell production. So that's the, that's going to that's going to really be the fundamental rate driver, and then whatever the slowest element of the whole uh, ba lithium ion battery cell uh, supply chain from mining. Uh, and the many steps of refining to ultimately creating a battery cell uh, uh, and putting it into a pack, that will be the limiting factor on progress towards sustainability. All right, so we need to talk more about batteries because the key thing that I want to understand, like there seems to be a scaling issue here that is kind of amazing and alarming. You have said that you have calculated that the amount of battery production that the world needs for sustainability is 300 terawatt hours of batteries. It, 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 that's the, 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 that's the end goal. Rough, very rough numbers, and I certainly would invite others to check our calculations because they may arrive at a different at different conclusions. But um, in order to uh, transition uh, not just um, current electricity production, but also uh, heating uh, and transport, 
uh, which roughly triples the amount of electricity that you need. Uh, it amounts to approximately 300 terawatt hours of installed capacity. So we need to give people a sense of how big a task that is. I mean, here we are, the Gigafactory. You know, this is what this is one of the biggest yeah. buildings in the world. Um, when what I've read, and tell me if this is still right, is that the goal here is to eventually produce um, 100 gigawatt hours of batteries here a year. We'll eventually. probably do more than that, but yes, that's hopefully we get there within a couple of years. Right. But I mean, that, so that is point, one, point, point 0.1 terawatt hours. But that's still one one hundredth of what's needed. How much of the rest of that 100 is, is Tesla planning to take on between, let's say, between now and 2030, 2040, um, when, when uh, you know, we really need to see the scale up happen? I mean, these are just guesses. I mean, um, so please, you know, people shouldn't hold me to these things. It's not like this is like uh, some, what, what does happen is I'll, 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 I'll make some like, you know, best guess and then people will, in five years, there'll be some jerk that writes an article, Elon said this would happen <laughs> and it didn't happen. He's a liar and a fool. Yeah. Uh, it's very <laughs> annoying when that happens. Uh, so these are just guesses. This is a conversation. Right. Um, I, I, like, I think Tesla probably ends up doing 10% of that, uh, roughly. 20, yes. Let's say 2050, we have this amazing, you know, 100% sustainable electric grid made up of, you know, some mixture of the, the yeah. sustainable energy sources you talked about. That, that same grid probably is offering the world really low cost energy, isn't it, compared, compared with now? And, yeah. and I'm, I'm curious about, like, do, should people, are people entitled to get a little bit excited about the possibilities of that? that world. People should be optimistic about the future. Um, the uh, humanity will solve sustainable energy. It will happen. If we are, you know, continue to, to push hard, the future is bright um, and good from an energy standpoint. Um, and then it, it will be possible to also use that, that energy to do uh, carbon sequestration. Uh, it takes a lot of energy to pull carbon out of the atmosphere just as it, because in, in, in putting it in the atmosphere, it releases energy. So now, right. you know, well, obviously in order to pull it out, you need to use a lot of energy. But if you've got um, a lot of uh, sustainable energy from wind and solar, uh, you can actually se sequester carbon, so you can re reverse the CO2 uh, right. parts per million of the atmosphere and, and, and oceans. Um, and, and also, uh, uh, you can really have as much fresh water, fresh water as you want. Um, Earth is mostly water. We should call Earth water. It's 70% water by surface area. Now, most of that's seawater, but it's still, it's like, uh, we just have to be on the, the bit that's land. Right. <laughs> um, and, and with energy, you can turn seawater into yes. irrigating water or yes. whatever water uh, you Absolutely. Need. Yeah, yeah. Um, at, at very low cost. Um, things will be good. Things, things will be good. Yes. Will be and good. also, there's other benefits, right, to this non-fossil fuel world where, where the air is cleaner and... Um, yes, exactly. And, yeah, yeah. Because, like, like when, you, when you burn fossil fuels, there's all, there's all these, like, uh, side reactions and, 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 and toxic gases of various kinds. Um, and, I'd like, like, I'd like to sort of uh, little par particulates <laughs> that, that are bad for your lungs. Right. Like, there's, there's all sorts of bad things that are happening that will go away. Okay. And, and the sky will be cleaner and quieter. The uh, future's going to be good. I want us to switch now to, to think a bit about artificial intelligence. And, but the segue there, let, you, you mentioned how, how annoying it is when people haul you up for bad predictions in the past. So I'm, I'm possibly going to be um, uh, annoying now. But um, I'm, I, I, I'm curious about yeah. your timelines and how you predict and how come some things are so amazingly on the money and some aren't. So when it comes to predicting sales of Tesla vehicles, for example. I mean, you've kind of been amazing. I think in 2014, when Tesla had sold that year 60,000 cars, you said, 2020, I think we will do half a million a year. Yeah, we did almost I, exactly half a million. You did almost exactly half a million. <clears throat> you were scoffed in 2014 because no one yeah. since Henry Ford with the Model T had, had come close to that kind of growth rate yes. for, for cars. Uh -huh. <clears throat> you were scoffed and you actually hit 500,000 cars and, yeah. and 510,000 or whatever produced. But five years ago, last time you came to TED, we, um, I asked you about full self-driving and um, you said, yep, this very year, hmm. I am confident that we will have a car going from 
LA to New York uh, without any intervention. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to blow your mind, but I'm not always right. <laughs> um, but so talk, talk, what, what's the difference <laughs> between those two? Why, why, why has full self-driving in particular been so hard to predict? I mean, the thing that really got me, and I think is going to get a lot of other people, is that there, there are just so many false dawns with, with self-driving, um, where you think, you think you've got the problem, have a handle on the problem, and then it, nope, uh, it turns out, uh, you, you just hit a ceiling, um, and and uh, uh, because what, ha what, what if you if you were to plot the progress, the, the progress looks like a log curve. So it's like yeah, you, a series of log curves. So uh, most people don't know what log curve is, I suppose. But it, 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 show, it, show the shape. It, 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 it goes it goes up sort of a, it, you know sort of a fairly straight right, way, right. and then it starts tailing off, right. and 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 you start and a kind of ocean getting above. diminishing returns. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and, and you're like, uh oh, this it was trending up, and now it's sort of curving over, and not, and and, and you you start getting to these what I call uh, local local maxima, uh, where uh, you, you don't realize basically how dumb you were. Uh, that's uh, <laughs> and then it, and then and then it happens again. So, um, and I, ultimately, um, now these things, in, 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 uh, you know, in retrospect, they seem obvious, but. Uh, in, in order to solve uh, full self-driving uh, properly, you actually just you have to solve real-world AI. Um, you because you, you, know, you say like, what are the road networks designed to, to work with? They're designed to work with a biological neural net, our brains, um, and with uh, vision, our eyes. Um, and so, in order to make it work uh, with computers, you basically need uh, to solve real-world AI. Uh, and, and vision, because because we, we we need uh, we we need cameras and silicon neural nets uh, in order to have to, to have self-driving work for a system that was designed for eyes and biological neural nets. It, mm -hmm. You know, when you I guess when you put it that way, it's sort of like quite obvious that the only way to solve full self-driving is to solve real-world uh, AI and sophisticated vision. What do you um, feel about the current architecture? Do you think you have an architecture now where where there is a chance for the logarithmic curve not to tail off any any time soon? Well, I mean, uh, admittedly, these these uh, may be an infamous uh, last words, but I I actually am confident that we will solve it this year, uh, that we will exceed. Uh, you're, you're like what the, the probability uh, of an accident? Uh, at what point do you exceed that of the average person? Right. Um, I think we will exceed that this year. What are you seeing behind the scenes that gives you that confidence? We're, we're almost at the point where we have a high quality uh, unified vector space. Like in the beginning, we were trying to do this with image recognition on individual uh, images. But if you look at one image out of a video, it's actually quite hard to see what's going on with, without uh, uh, ambiguity. But if you look at a, at, a, at a video segment of a few seconds of video, that ambiguity resolves. Mm. Um, so the so the first thing we had to do was sort of tie all eight cameras together so the syn they're synchronized so the, all all the frames are looked at simultaneously and labeled simultaneously by by a one person because we still need human labeling. Mm. Um, uh, so so that at least they're not labeled at different times by different people in different ways. Um, and then uh, so so it's 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 sort of a surround picture. Then then a very important part is to add the time dimension. So, so that you, you're looking at surround video, um, mm -hmm. and you're labeling surround video, um, and uh, this is actually quite difficult to do from a software standpoint. Um, we had to uh, write our own uh, uh, labeling tools um, and then uh, create uh, an, an auto labeling, uh, create auto labeling software to amplify the efficiency of human labelers because it's quite hard to label video. It takes it, in the beginning, it was taking several hours to label a 10-second video clip. Mm. This is not s scalable. Right. Uh, so, so basically, w what you have to have is you have to have surround video, and the, the that surround video has to be primarily uh, automatically labeled with humans just being editors of and, and, right. and making slight corrections to the to the, the labeling of the video, uh, and then. Uh, feeding back those corrections into the future auto labeler. So you get this, this flywheel eventually where the auto labeler is able to take in vast amounts of video and with high accuracy automatically label uh, the video for uh, you know, cars, lane lines, drive space. What you're saying is that, though, that you, you think that, I mean, the, the result of this is that you're effectively giving the car a 
3D model of the actual objects that are all around it. It knows what they are and it knows how fast they are moving. And th the remaining task is to, yes. is to predict what the quirky behaviors are. That, that, you know, that when a pedestrian is walking down the road with a smaller pedestrian, that maybe that smaller pedestrian might do something unpredictable or like th yes. things like that, that it, so you have to build into it before you can you, really call it safe. You, you basically you need to have um, uh, memory across time and space. Uh, so what I mean by that is, um, if if you uh, because you, you you can't the, me the memory can't be infinite because it's using up a lot of of, of, of the computer's RAM basically. Uh, so you have to say how much are you going to try to remember? Um, uh, but like if it's very common for things to be occluded. So right. like if you talk about say a, a pedestrian walking past a, a truck where you saw the pedestrian um, start on one side of the truck, then they then they're occluded by the truck. Right. Uh, you need, but but you need think, you, you would know intuitively. Okay, this, that pressure is going to pop out the other side most likely. Right. And and the and computer you, doesn't know. So you need to slow all. down. I mean, a skeptic yeah. is going to say that every year for the last five years, you've you've kind of said, well, no, this is the year. Well, I mean, we're confident that it, we're we're there in a year or two, or you know, like it's it's always been about that that far away. But you're. We've got a new architecture now. You're 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 seeing enough improvement behind the scenes to to make you not certain, but but pretty confident that that this by by the end of this year, what in most not in every city in every circumstance, but in many cities and circumstances, basically the the car will be able to drive without interventions safer than a human. Um, yes, I mean the, the the car currently drives me around Austin most of the time with no interventions, so it's not like. Um and, 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 and we have uh, over 100,000 people in our uh, uh, full self-driving beta program. Uh, so you can look at the videos that they post online. Um, I do. <laughs> okay, great. Um, and, uh, and some of them are great, and some of them are a little terrifying. I mean, occasionally yes. the car seems to sort of like veer off and scare the hell out of people. Um, but, it's, um, it's still better. Uh, <laughs> it's still better. Uh, but but you but the, the no, but, but you're behind the scenes looking at the data. You're seeing enough improvement to to, to believe that. At this year, timeline is real. Yes, it, it, that's what it seems like. like I mean, I, like I said, yeah. the, you know, we could be here uh, talking again in a year. It's like, well, yet <laughs> another year went by and it didn't happen. But I think this, I think this is the year. And so, in general, when when people talk about Elon Elon time, I mean, it sounds like like you can't just have a general rule that if you predict that something will be done in six months, actually, what you what we should imagine is it's going to be a year or it's like two x or three x. It depends on the type of prediction. Some things, I guess, things involving Software, uh, you know, AI, whatever, are fundamentally harder to predict than than others. Is there an element that you actually deliberately make aggressive prediction timelines to drive people to be ambitious? Uh, without that, nothing gets done. Well, I, I generally believe, um, in terms of internal uh, timelines, that we want to set set the most aggressive timeline that we can, um, uh, because there's sort of like a law of gases expansion where for schedules where whatever time you set, it's it's not going to be less than that. It's very right. rare that it'll be less than that. Um, but it, and as far as my predictions are concerned, um, what, what tends to happen in the media is that they will report all the wrong ones and ignore all the right ones. Right. Um, and, uh, <laughs> or, or, you know, when, when, when writing an article about me, I've had a long career in multiple industries. If you if you list my sins, I sound like the worst person on earth. But if you put those against the my you know the things I've done right, it, it makes much more sense. Uh, you know, so it, it's essentially like the, the longer you do anything, the the more mistakes that that, right. that you will make cumulatively. Which, if you sum up those mistakes, will sound like uh, I'm the worst predictor ever. But for example, for Tesla vehicle growth, uh, I, I said I think we'd do 50 percent, and we, we've we've done 80 percent. Yes. Uh, so, uh, but they don't mention that one. Uh, so, it, it, I mean, I'm not sure what my exact track record is on predictions. They're more optimistic than pessimistic, but they're not all optimistic. Um, some of them uh, are exceeded. Uh, probably more are later, um, but they. Uh, they they do come true. It's very rare that they do not come true. It's sort of like uh, you know, uh, you know, if, if, if there's some ra radical technology prediction, uh, the, the the point is not that it was a few years late, but that it happened at all. Right. <laughs> that's the that's the more so, important part. <laughs> so it's, it feels like at some point in the last year, seeing the progress on 
understanding that your that the AI, the Tesla AI, understanding the world around it, led to a kind of an aha moment in Tesla. Because you really surprised people recently when you said probably the most important product development going on at Tesla this year is this robot Optimus. Yes. Many companies out there have tried to put out these robots. They've been working on them for years, and so far no one has really cracked it. There's no mass adoption robot in people's homes. There are some in in manufacturing, but it like I, I would say that no one's kind of really cracked it. What is it? Something that happened in the development of full self driving that gave you the confidence to say, you know what, we could do something special here. Yeah, exactly. So you know, it took me a while to sort of realize this. That, that, that in order to solve self-driving, you really needed to solve real-world AI. Um, and at the point at which you solve real-world AI for a car, which is really a robot on four wheels, uh, you can then generalize that to a robot on legs as well. The, the two hard parts, I think, like it's not, it, obviously companies like Boston Dynamics have shown that it's possible to make uh, uh, quite compelling, sometimes alarming robots. Right. Um, you know, so so the, the, from a sensors and actuator standpoint, it's certainly uh, been demonstrated by by many that it's possible to make a humanoid robot. The thing that the things that are uh, currently missing are uh, it, enough intelligence, to, enough intel intelligence for the robot to navigate the real world and do useful things um, without being uh, explicitly instructed. It, so so the, the missing things are basically real world uh, intelligence and uh, scaling up manufacturing. Um, those are two things that Tesla is very good at and. Uh, so then we, we basically just need to design the, the uh, specialized actuators and sensors that are needed for a humanoid robot. Pe people have no idea. This is, this is going to be bigger than the car. <laughs> so let's dig into e e exactly that. I mean, in one way, it's actually an easier problem than full self-driving because you, instead of an object going along at 60 miles an hour, which yeah. if it gets it wrong, well, someone will die, this is an object that's engineered to only go at, what, three or four or five miles yeah, an hour. Yeah, walking speed, basically. And so a mistake isn't, there aren't lives at stake. There might be embarrassment yeah. at stake. As long or whatever, as the but AI doesn't take it over and... Uh, uh, <laughs> right. And murder us in our sleep or something. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, um, but so, so talk about, I mean, I, I think the first applications you're, you've mentioned are probably going to be manufacturing, but eventually the vision is to, to have these available for people at home, correct? Yes. If you had a robot that really understood the 3D architecture of your house and knew where every object in that house was or was supposed sure. to be and could recognize all those objects, I mean, that, that's kind of amazing, isn't it? Like, like that, the kind of thing that you could ask a robot to do would be what? Like, tidy up. Yeah, um, absolutely. <laughs> or make, make, make dinner. I guess uh, mow the lawn. Take take uh, a cup of tea to grandma and show yeah, her family absolutely. pictures. And exactly. Take care of my grandmother and make sure. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it could recognize obviously recognize everyone in the home. Yeah. Could play catch with your kids. Yes. I mean, obviously, we need to be careful that this doesn't uh, become a dystopian situation. Um, um, like, I think one of the things that's going to be important is to have uh, a localized ROM chip uh, on the robot that cannot be updated uh, over the air, uh, where if you, for example, were to say, stop, 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 that would, if anyone said that, then the robot would stop, you know, type of thing. Um, and that's not updatable remotely. Um, I think it's going to be important to have safety features like that. Yeah, that, that sounds wise. And I do think there should be a regulatory agency for AI. I've said right. this for many years. I don't, I don't love being regulated, but I, you know, I think this is an important thing for public safety. Let, let, let's come back to that. But I'm, I'm just, I, I don't think many people have really sort of taken seriously the notion of, you know, a, a, a robot at home. I mean, at the, at the start of the computing revolution, you know, Bill Gates said, there's going to be a computer in every home. And people at the time said, yeah, whatever. Right. Who, who would even want that? <laughs> yeah, do, now do, we have is, a computer is, in our pocket. Do, do you think there will be, basically, like, in, say, say 2050 or whatever, that, that like a, a, a robot in most homes is, is what there will be? And people yeah, will, will, will I think they probably love will. them and count on them. You'll have your own butler, basically. Yeah, you'll have your sort of buddy robot. Probably, yeah. I mean, how much of a buddy? Do you, like, do you, do you, how, how many applications do you thought? Is there, you know, can you have a romantic partner, a sex partner? I mean, a lot of it's probably inevitable. I mean, I did promise no. the internet that I'd make cat girls. We, how, we could make a robot cat girl. <laughs> I mean, you, Be careful I mean, I, what I mean, you I mean, promise the internet, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so, yeah, I, I guess uh, it'll be what, what, whatever people want, really, you know. So. 
What what sort of timeline should we be thinking about of the first the first models that are actually made and sold? Well, you know, the the, the first units that that we tend to make are um, for jobs that are dangerous, boring, repetitive, and things that people don't want to do. And uh, you know, I, I think we'll have like an interesting prototype uh, sometime this year. We we might have something useful next year, but I think quite likely within at least two years. Uh, and then we'll see rapid growth year over year of the usefulness of the humanoid robots um, and decrease in cost and, and scaling up production. Initially, just selling to businesses, uh, or when, yeah. when do you picture you'll, you'll sell? You'll start selling them where you can buy your parents one for Christmas or something. I'd say less than ten years. Yeah. How 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 how, yeah. how help me on the economics of this? So, what, what what do you picture the cost of one of these being? Well, I think the cost is actually not going to be uh, crazy high. Um, like less than a car. Initially, things will be expensive because it, it'll be new technology at low right. production volume. The complexity and cost of a car is greater than that of a humanoid robot. Um, so I would expect that it's going to be less than a car or at least equivalent to a cheap car. So even if it starts at 50K, within a few years it's down to 20K or lower or whatever. To, and, and maybe for home they'll get much cheaper still. But, yeah. but, but, but think about the economics of this. If you can replace a $30,000, $40,000 a year worker, which you have to pay every year, with a one-time payment of $25,000 for a robot that can work longer hours, a pretty yeah. rapid replacement so, of certain types of jobs. How worried should the world be about that? I wouldn't worry about the, the sort of putting people out of a job thing. Um, I think we're actually going to have, and, and already do have, a massive shortage of labor. So I, th I, th I think we'll, we will have um, uh, not, not people out of work, but actually still a shortage of labor even in the future. Uh, but the, the, this really will be a world of abundance. Any goods and services uh, will be available to anyone who wants them. That it'll be so cheap to have goods and services, it'll be ridiculous. And presumably it should be possible to imagine a bunch of goods and services that can't profitably be made now, but could be made in, the, sure. in that world, courtesy of, of legions of robots. Um, yeah. Um, it, it will be a world of abundance. The only scarcity that will exist in the future is that which we decide to create ourselves as humans. Okay, so AI is, is allowing us to imagine a, a, a differently powered economy that, uh, that will create this abundance. What are you most worried about going wrong? Well, like I said, uh, you know, AI and robotics will, will bring, um, bring out what might be termed the age of abundance. Um, other people have used this word. Um, and, and, and that this is my prediction, will be an age of abundance um, for everyone. Um, the, 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 I guess there's, uh, the, the dangers would be the artificial general intelligence or digital super intelligence uh, decouples from a, co a collective human will and uh, goes in a direction that for some reason we don't like, uh, for whatever, whatever direction it might go. Um, you know, that's what it, sort of the, the idea behind Neuralink is to try to more tightly couple uh, collective human will to uh, the to, to digital uh, superintelligence, um, and, and also along the way solve a, a, a lot of um, uh, brain injuries and spinal injuries and that kind of thing. So uh, even if it doesn't succeed in the greater goal, it will. I think it will succeed in in the uh, goal of alleviating uh, brain and spine damage. So the, um, the, the spirit there is that if we're going to make these AIs that are so vastly intelligent, we ought to be wired directly to them so that we, we ourselves can have those superpowers more, more directly. But that doesn't seem to avoid the risk that those superpowers might um, turn ugly in an unintended way. No, I think it's a risk. I agree. I, 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 I don't, I, I'm not saying that I have some uh, a certain uh, answer to that risk. I'm... I'm I'm just saying, like, like maybe one of the things that would be good for ensuring that uh, the future is one that we want is to more tightly couple uh, the human world, collective human world, to digital intelligence. Mm. Um, the, the the issue that we face here is that we're already um, a cyborg. If you think about it, the computers uh, are an extension of ourselves. Um, and when we die, there's like we have like a digital ghost. You know, all of our text messages and 
social media and emails and it's it's quite eerie actually when someone dies and and they're but everything online is still there but but you say like what what's the limitation what what is it that um inhibits human machine symbiosis it's the data rate when you communicate especially with a phone you're moving your thumbs right very slowly so you're like moving your two little meat sticks <laughs> right at at a rate that's maybe 10 bits per second optimistically 100 bits per second and computers are are communicating at the gigabit uh level and beyond have you seen evidence that the technology is actually working that you've got you've got a richer sort of higher bandwidth connection if you like uh between ele- external electronics and a brain than has been possible before uh yeah so the i mean the, the fundamental principles of uh of reading neurons uh sort of doing read write on neurons w- with tiny electrodes um have been demonstrated for decades um so it's not like uh this is uh the the concept is new what the, the the problem is that there's no product uh that works well that you can go and uh and buy so it's it's all sort of in research labs right. um and it's it's not it's uh like there's there's always like some cord sticking out of your your head and it it's quite gruesome and it's it's really um there's there's no good product uh, mm. that 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 actually does a good job and is high bandwidth and safe and something you'd actually that you could buy and would want to buy so um but but in it the 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 way to think of the uh, neuralink device is kind of like a a fitbit or an apple watch um that's uh where where we 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 take out a, a sort of a, a small section of skull about the size of a quarter um replace that with uh what in many ways really is very much like um uh fit but apple watch or, or or some kind of smart watch thing um uh and um and, and but but with with tiny tiny wires very 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 tiny wires tiny uh, wires so tiny it's hard to even see them hmm. um and it's very important to have very tiny wires so that you uh, when they're implanted they don't they don't damage the brain how far yeah. are you from putting these into humans i i well we we have um put in our fda application uh, uh to have the uh, aspirationally do do the first uh, human implant this year the first uses will be for neurological injuries of different kinds yes but rolling the clock forward and imagining when when people are actually using these for their own enhancement let's say and for the enhancement of the world to, how clear are you in your mind as to what it will feel like to have one of these inside your head well i i do want to emphasize we're we're, we're at a very, at, at an early stage and so um it really will be many years before we have anything uh, approximating a high bandwidth uh a neural interface uh that allows for uh AI human symbiosis. Um and for for many years we will just be solving uh brain injuries and spinal injuries for probably a decade. Mm-hmm. Um this is the, and this is not something that will suddenly one day it'll will have this incredible uh, sort of uh, whole brain interface. Um it, it's going to be like I said at least a decade of of really just solving um of uh, uh, brain injuries and and spinal injuries um and and really I think you can solve a very wide range of of brain injuries including severe depression uh morbid obesity uh sleep uh it's uh, potentially schizophrenia like a lot of things that cause right. great stress to people uh restoring uh memory in in, in older people if you can pull that off that is that that's the app i will sign up for like, <laughs> absolutely I, I i would please hurry actually yeah no, <laughs> um i i mean the 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 emails that we get at neuralink um are heartbreaking um i mean they they they'll send us just tragic you know you know where where someone was was sort of in the prime of life and 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 they had an accident on a, a motorcycle and 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 someone who's 25 is is you know it can't even feed themselves and mm. and this is something we could fix um but but you have you have said that ai is one of the things you're most worried about and that neuralink may be one of the ways where we can keep a breast of it or i yes it's it's it, there's there's the, the the short term thing which i think is helpful on an individual human level um with with injuries and then the long term thing is an attempt to uh 
address the civilizational risk of, of AI by uh, bringing, bringing um, digital intelligence and biological intelligence uh, closer together. I mean, if you think of how the brain works today, there are really kind of two layers to the brain. There's the limbic system and the, the, the cortex. You've got the kind of animal brain where it's kind of like the fun part, really. Um, and That's where most of Twitter operates, by the way. Um, yeah, I mean, we're... <laughs> I think, like Tim Evans said, this like we're we're, we're like we're like somebody uh, you know stuck a computer on a monkey, right? Um, you know, <laughs> so we're, we're like if if you gave a monkey a, a computer, that's our cortex, but we still have a lot of monkey instincts, right? So, uh, which we then try to rationalize as no, it's not a monkey instinct; it's something more important than that. But it's often just really a monkey instinct. We're in this we're, we're just monkeys with a computer stuck stu stuck in our brain, um, so. Um, but, but, but even though the cortex is sort of the smart or the intelligent part of the, the, the brain, the thinking part of the brain, um, people are quite, I've not yet, yet met anyone who wants to delete their limbic system or their cortex. They're quite happy right. having both. Everyone wants both parts of their brain. And, um, and people really want their, their phones and their computers, which are really the, the tertiary, the third part of, of, of your intelligence. It's just that it's, it's like I said, the, it's, the, the Bandwidth, the, the rate of communication with that tertiary layer is uh, is slow, um, and it's just a very tiny straw mm. to, to this tertiary layer, and and we want to make that tiny straw a, a big highway. Um, and I, I'm definitely not saying that this is going to solve everything, or this is, you know, it, it's the only thing. It's 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 something that 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 might be helpful. Um, and, and, and worst case scenario, I think we, we solve some important brain injury, spinal injury issues, and that's still a great outcome. Right, best case scenario, we may discover new human possibility, telepathy you've spoken of, in it's a way, a connection with, yes. with, with, with a loved one, you know, full memory, yes. um, um, and, and much faster thought processing, may, maybe, yes. all these things. It's very cool. If AI were to take down Earth. We need a plan B. Let's let's shift oh, our attention to, to to space. We we spoke last time about reusability and you, you had just demonstrated that spectacularly for the first time. Since then you've gone on to build this monster rocket starship, yes. um, which kind of changes the rules of the game in, in spectacular ways. Tell us tell us about Starship. Yes. Starship How is extremely fundamental. So the the holy grail of of, of rocketry uh, or space transport is full and rapid reusability. This has never been achieved. The closest that um, anything's come is our Falcon 9 rocket where we uh, are able to recover the, 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 pre the, the first stage, the, the, the boost stage, which is uh, probably about 60% of the cost of the vehicle um, or of, of the whole launch, uh, maybe 70%. Um, and uh, we've now done that over 100 times. So uh, with Starship, uh, we will be recovering um, the entire thing. That's the, or at least that's the goal. Right. Um, and 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 moreover, recovering it in such a way that it can be immediately reflown. Uh, whereas with Falcon 9, we still need to do some amount of refurbishment to the booster and to the the, the fairing or nose, nose cone. So, um, but with Starship, the design uh, goal is uh, immediate reflight. Uh, right. So you just you, you just refill propellants and and go again, and. The, the this is gigantic. It just just as it would be in, in any other mode of transport. And it's and the the main design is 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 to basically take what a hundred plus people at a time yeah. plus a bunch of things that they need to Mars. So so talk, first of all, talk talk about that piece. What what is your latest timeline? One for the first time, a starship goes to Mars, presumably without yes. people but just equipment. Two with people, three, the sort of okay, sure. 100 people at a time. Let's let's go. Sure. Well, and, and and just to put the, the, the cost thing into perspective, um, the 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 cost of the expected cost of Starship putting 100 tons into orbit um, is significantly less than what um, it would have cost, or what it did cost to put our our tiny Falcon One rocket in, into orbit. Um, just as the cost of flying a 747 around the world uh, is is less than the cost of a small airplane, you know, a small airplane that was thrown away. Um, so it, it's really pretty mind-boggling um, that that the giant thing costs less, way less than the small thing. So it it, it doesn't use 
sort of exotic propellants or, or things that are difficult to obtain on Mars. Um, it uses uh, methane as fuel, and it's, it's primarily oxygen. It's sort of roughly 77, 78% oxygen uh, by weight. Um, and it, Mars has a CO2 atmosphere and has water ice, which is CO2 plus H2O, so you can make CH4, methane, and O2 oxygen right. on one, Mars. What, presumably one of the first tasks on Mars will be to create yes. a fuel plant that can create the fuel for the return yes. trips of m many starships. Yes, and, and uh, actually, it's, it's mostly going to be an oxygen plant, but, it, but it's because it, it's, it's, um, it's, it's, call it 78% oxygen, 22% fuel. Mm. Um, but, but, but the fuel is a simple fuel that is, is easy to create on Mars. Um, and and, in, and other, many other parts of the solar system. So basically, um, it's, and it's all propulsive landing, no parachutes, um, uh, nothing thrown away. Uh, uh, it has a, a heat shield that's capable of entering on Earth or Mars. Um, we could even potentially go to Venus, but it's not, you don't want to go there. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, Venus is hell, uh, almost literally. Um, but you, you, you could, uh, it, it's a generalized method of transport to, to anywhere in the solar system, because um, the point at which you have a propellant depot on Mars, you can then travel to the asteroid belt uh, and to the moons of, of Jupiter and then to, the moon, to Saturn and, and ultimately anywhere in the solar system. Right, yeah. so, but your main, fo your main fo focus and SpaceX's main focus is still Mars. Like that, that, is, that, is, the, that is the mission, that is, that is where most of the yeah. effort Will, will go, or, yeah, that, or, are, you, or are, you, yes. are you actually it's, it's, imagining a much broader array of uses, even in, in the coming, you know, the first decade or so of uses of this, where we could go, yeah. for example, to other places in the solar, solar system to explore, perhaps NASA wants to use the rocket for that reason. Yeah, NASA, NASA is planning to use a starship to re return to the moon, to return yes. uh, people to the moon. Um, and uh, so we're very hon honored that NASA has chosen us to do this. Um, uh, so, uh, it, but I'm saying it, it, is, a, it is a generalized, uh, it's, a, it's a general solution to uh, getting anywhere in the greater uh, solar system. It's not suitable for going right. to another star system, but it is a general solution for transport anywhere in the, in the solar system. Before it can do any of that, it's got to demonstrate it can get into orbit, you know, around Earth. Yeah. What's 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 your latest advice on the on the timeline for that? It's looking promising for us to have an orbital launch attempt uh, in in a few months. Um, so uh, we're actually integrating the uh, we'll be integrating the engines uh, into the booster for the first orbital flight uh, starting in about a week or two, um, and. Um, the, the 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 launch complex itself is uh, ready to go, so assuming we get regulatory approval, I think we could have a uh, an orbital launch attempt uh, within a few months. And a, uh, a radical new technology like this, presumably there is real risk on those early attempts. Oh, percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like <laughs> I mean, the joke I make all the time is that. Uh, uh, excitement is guaranteed. Success is not guaranteed, but excitement certainly is. Um, but but the, la the last I saw on your timeline, you, you've slightly put back the expected date to put uh, the first human on Mars till 2029, I, I want to say. Um, yeah, I mean, so, so uh, let's see. I mean, we, 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 are, we have built a production system for Starship, so we're, 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 we're making a lot of ships and boosters. And how, how, how many are you planning to make, actually? Well, we're currently expecting to um, make a, a booster and a ship roughly uh, every, well, initially roughly every couple months, and hopefully by, by the end of this year, um, uh, one every month. So it's, it's giant rockets, but a lot, and a lot of them. Just in terms, talking in terms of rough orders of magnitude, in order to uh, create a self-sustaining city on Mars, I, I think the, you, we'll need something on the order of a thousand ships. And we just need a, we just need a Helen of, 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 of Sparta, uh, I guess, on the on Mars. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is not in most people's the, heads, Elon. The planet that launched a thousand ships. <laughs> That's, that's nice. But this is not in most people's heads, this picture that you have in your mind that, so there's, there's, there's basically a two year window. Right? Every, you can only really fly to yeah. Mars conveniently every two years. Yes. You are still, you are picturing that during, during the 2030s, every couple of years, something like a thousand starships take off, each containing a hundred or more people. Yes. I mean, that, that, that 
picture is just completely mind-blowing to me. Yes. That, that sense of this armada of humans going yeah, to... Yeah, like Battlestar Galactica, the fleet of departs. And you think that, that it can basically be funded by people spending maybe a couple, couple hundred grand on a ticket to move yeah. to Mars? Is that, is that price about where it, where it has been? Well, I think it, it, you say like, what's what's ne what's required in order to get enough people and enough cargo to Mars to uh, build a self-sustaining city, um, and it's where you have an intersection of sets of people who want to go because I think only a small percentage of humanity will want to go um, and can afford to go or get sponsorship in some manner. Uh, that intersection of sets I think needs to be a million people or something like that. Um, and so it's what, what, what can a million people afford or get sponsorship for, or because uh, I think governments will also pay for it and um, people can take out loans. And, but, but, but I think at the point at which um, you say, okay, okay like if, if moving to Mars costs, uh, for argument's sake, um, $100,000, then I think um, you know, almost anyone can, can work uh, and save up and, and, and eventually have $100,000 and, and be able to go to Mars if they want. We want to make it available to anyone who wants to go. Yeah. Um, so uh, it, and, and, and very important to emphasize that Mars, especially in the beginning, will not be luxurious. It will be dangerous, uh, cramped, difficult, hard work. It's kind of like that Shackleton ad for going to the Antarctic, um, which I think is actually not real, but, but it sounds real and it's cool. Uh, yeah. it, it, it's sort of like the, the, the sales pitch for going to Mars is it's, it's, it's dangerous, it's cramped, uh, you might not make it back, uh, it's difficult, it's hard work. That's the sales pitch. Right. But, <laughs> but you will make history. One, yeah. one, one, one but it'll another. be glorious. Right. Oh, so on that kind of launch rate you're talking about, it, over two decades you could get your million people to, to Mars, essentially. Whose city is it? Is it NASA's city? Is it SpaceX's city? It's the people like, of Mars' city. Uh, the, 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 the reason for this, I mean, I have to say, like, what, what, we feel like, well, why, why, why do this thing? It's, I, I think this is important uh, for maximizing the probable lifespan of, of humanity or, or consciousness. Human civilization could come to an end for external reasons like a giant meteor or super volcanoes or uh, extreme climate change uh, or, or, or uh, World War III uh, right. or, you know, any, any one of a number of reasons. Um, and and um, but the probable lifespan of, hum of of civilizational consciousness as we know it, um, which we should really view as this very delicate thing, like a small candle in a vast darkness, that's that's caught, that that is what appears to be the case. Um, of, we're in this vast darkness of space, um, and there's this little candle of consciousness that's only really come about um, after four and a half billion years. Yeah. And um, it could just go out. I think that's powerful, and I think I think a lot of people will be inspired by that vision. And and the reason, so the reason you need the million people is because they there has to be enough people there to do everything that you yes. need to survive. It's the, 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 uh, really the, like the, the the critical threshold is um, if the sh ships from Earth stop coming for any reason. Right. Um, does it does the, the Mars city die out or or not? Right. And and w so we have. To, Past that, that's uh, you know people talk about like these the sort of the great filters the things that perhaps um, uh, you know we talk about the Fermi paradox and where are the aliens and like well maybe the aliens didn't there is various great filters that the aliens didn't pass and and so they eventually just cease to exist and one of the great filters is becoming a multi-planet species so we want to pass that filter um, mm. and and uh, I'll be long dead before this is. Uh, you know, a real, real thing before before it happens. But I'd I'd like I'd like to at least see us make a, a great progress in this direction. Given how tortured the Earth is right now, how much we're beating each other up, sh shouldn't there be discussions going on with everyone who is dreaming about Mars to try to say, we've got a once, once in a civilization's chance yeah. to make some new rules here. Is that it, should someone be trying to lead those d discussions to figure out what it what it means for this to be the people of Mars' city? Well, I think ultimately this will be up to the people of Mars to decide what uh, how they want to rethink society. Yet there's there's certainly risk there, um, and uh, hopefully 
the people of Mars will be uh, more enlightened and will not uh, fight amongst each other too much. Uh, I mean, I have some recommendations, but which people of Mars may choose to uh, listen to or not. I mean, I would advocate for more of a direct democracy, not a representative democracy, um, and laws that are short enough for people to understand, um, and uh, where it is, it is harder to create laws than to uh, get rid of them. Coming back a bit nearer term, I'd love you to just talk a bit about some of the other possibility space that Starship um, seems to have created. Yeah. So given, given suddenly we've got this ability to move 100 tons plus into orbit. Yes. What, so we've just spent, we've just launched the James Webb Telescope, which is an incredible thing. It's unbelievable yeah. what happened. So it's two decades. It's an exquisite piece of technology. It's an exquisite piece of technology. But people spent two years trying to figure out how to fold up this thing. It's yes. a three-ton It's a three -ton telescope. We can make it a lot easier if you've got more volume and mass. Well, so, so, but, let's, but let's ask a different question, which is what, 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 how much more powerful a telescope could someone design based on using Starship, for example? Um, I, mean, I, I mean, roughly, I'd say it's probably an order of magnitude more resolution. Um, if you've got 100 tons and 1,000 cubic meters volume, which is roughly what we have. And what about other exploration through the solar system? I mean, I'm, I'm you know... Europa. Uh, you, well, Europa, big, so... Big, big, big question mark. Right, so, so there's an ocean there, right? Yeah. And, and what you really want to do is to drop a submarine into the yeah, ocean. Yeah, I mean, maybe there's like some squid civilization uh, under the cephalopod civilization under the ice of Europa, that would be pretty interesting. I mean, Elon, if, if you could take a, a submarine to Europa and we see pictures of this thing being devoured by a squid, yeah, that I would mean, honestly be the happiest moment of my life. Pretty right? wild, that, yeah. That would be... What, what, what are the possibilities are out there? Like, cause it, it feels like if, if you're going to create a thousand of these things, they can only fly to Mars every two years. What are they doing the rest of the time, it feels like there's this this right. m explosion of possibility that I don't think people are really thinking about. I mean, I don't know. We've certainly got a long way to go, as you alluded to uh, earlier. We've, we still have to get to orbit, uh, <laughs> and, and then um, after we get to orbit, we have to um, re really prove out and refine uh, full and rapid reusability. Uh, that'll take a moment, um, and um, but but the, I do think we will solve this. I, I'm I, highly confident we will solve this at this point. Um, do, you, do you ever wake up with the fear that there's going to be this Hindenburg moment for SpaceX where... We've had a, many Hindenburg. Well, we've, we've never had Hindenburg moments with people, uh, right. which is very important. Big difference. Right, uh, there is. <laughs> but we've blown up quite a few rockets. So there's, we have a, 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 uh, there's a whole compilation online that we've put together and others put together. Uh, it's showing rockets are hard. Um, yeah. I mean, the sheer amount of uh, energy going through a rocket is it boggles the mind. So... Yeah. You know, get, getting out of Earth's gravity well is difficult. We have a strong gravity and a thick atmosphere, and, and, um, and, and Mars, which is uh, less than 40% of, it's, it's like I think 37% of Earth's gravity um, and has a thin atmosphere, uh, the ship alone can go all the way from the surface of Mars to the surface of Earth, um, whereas getting to Mars requires a giant booster and orbital refilling. So, Elon, is that so I think more about this incredible array of things that you're involved with. I keep seeing these synergies, to use a horrible word, um, bet between them. You know, for example, the robots you're building from Tesla could possibly be pretty handy on Mars, sure. um, doing some of the dangerous work and so forth. I mean, is, maybe there's a scenario where your city on Mars doesn't need a million people, it needs half a million people and half a million robots. Sure. And um, that's a possibility. Maybe the Boring Company could play a role helping create some of the subterranean um, dwelling spaces that you might need. Yeah. Um, back on planet Earth, it, it seems like a partnership between Boring Company and Tesla could offer an unbelievable deal to a city to say, we, we will create for you a 3D network of tunnels populated by robo-taxis yeah. that will offer fast, low-cost transport to anyone. You know, full self-driving may or may not be done this year. And in, and in some cities, like somewhere like Mumbai, I'm, I suspect won't be done for a decade. Some it's places just, are uh, more challenging hard. than others. But <laughs> yes. today, today with what you've got, you could put a 3D n network of tunnels under there. Oh, if it's just in a tunnel, that's a sole problem, and basically. It, exactly. Full yeah. self-driving is a sole problem. So, so to me, there's, there's amazing synergy there. Um, you're, with with, with uh, Starship, you know, Gwyn Shotwell talked about 
by 2028 having from city to city, you know, transport on planet yeah, Earth. Yeah, this is a, a, a real possibility. It's, it, it's a, uh, yeah, uh, the, the fastest way to get from one place to another, if it's a long distance, is, is a rocket. It's, right. uh, it's basically an ICBM right. with the but it has to land, landing to lead the nuke. <laughs> because it's an ICBM, it has to land probably offshore. Yes, yeah, so um, it's loud. Because it's loud. So, <laughs> so why not have a tunnel that then connects to the city yeah, with, cool. with Tesla? Sure. So, so, and, and Neuralink, I mean, if you're going to go to Mars, having a telepathic connection with loved ones back home, even if there's a time <laughs> delay. I mean, I, I'm not, I, I, if these are not intended to be connected, by the way, <laughs> they're just. <laughs> But, I, but there should, certainly could be some synergies, yeah. Surely there is a growing argument that you should actually put all these things together into one company and just, just have a company devoted to creating a future that's exciting and let a thousand flowers bloom. Have you, have you been thinking about that? I mean, it is tricky because Tesla is a publicly traded company and the, the investor base of... Tesla and SpaceX and, and certainly Boring Company and Neuralink are quite different. And Boring Company and Neuralink are, are, are tiny companies. Just right, by comparison. The audience may, may <laughs> yeah. Tesla's got 110,000 people. Uh, SpaceX, I think, is around 12,000 people. Uh, Boring Company and Neuralink are uh, both under 200 people. So uh, they're little, little tiny companies, but they will probably get bigger in the future. They will get bigger in the future. It's not that easy to sort of combine these things. Um, Traditionally, you've said that for SpaceX, especially, you don't, you wouldn't want it public because public investors wouldn't support um, the craziness of the idea of going to Mars or whatever. And, and yeah. you want to, you know, making life multiplanetary is, is outside of the the normal uh, t uh, time horizon of Wall Street right. analysts, <laughs> but, but <laughs> to I say think, the least. I think something's changed though. Um, what's changed is that Tesla is now so powerful and so big and, and throws off so much cash that you actually could connect the dots here, just tell the public that X billion dollars a year, whatever your number is, will be diverted to the Mars mission. I, I suspect you'd have massive interest in that company and it might, it might unlock a lot more possibility for you, no? I mean, I would like to give the public access to uh, ownership of SpaceX, uh, but I mean the thing that, it, like the the overhead associated with a public company, uh, is high. Um, so, the, the, I mean, as a public company, you're just constantly sued. It does occupy like a fair bit of, uh, you know, time and effort to uh, deal with these things. Right, but you would still only have one public company. It would be bigger and um, have more things going on, but instead of being on four boards, you'd be on one. I'm actually not even on the, the Neuralink or Boring Company boards. Oh, oh well. Okay. Yeah, and I, I don't really attend the SpaceX board meetings. We only have two a year, and I, I just stop by and chat for an hour. Um, so okay. uh, the, the board but overhead for a public company is much higher. Right. I think some investors probably worry about how your time is being split, and, and they, would be, they might be excited by, you know, that. That's. Anyway, I... Um, I just, I just woke up the other day think, thinking just there are so many ways in which these things connect. And, and, and you know, the, the, just the, note, the simplicity of that mission of building a future that is worth getting excited about might, might appeal to um, an awful lot of people. Um, Elon, you are reported by Forbes and everyone else as, as now, you know, the world's richest person. That's not a sovereign. <laughs> you know, I think it's fair to say that... Uh, if somebody is like the king or de facto uh, king of a country, they're wealthier than I am. So, but, but it's just harder to measure. But what people do, so, so $300 billion, I mean, your, your net worth on any given day is rising or falling by <laughs> yeah. several billion dollars. How insane, <laughs> how insane it's, it's is bonkers, that? Yeah. I mean, does that, how, how, do you, how do you handle that psychologically? Very, there aren't many people in the world who have to even think about that. I, I actually don't think about that too much, but the the the, the thing that is actually uh, more more difficult and and that does make sleeping difficult is that um, you know every good hour uh, or even minute of thinking about uh, Tesla and, and SpaceX has such a big effect on the company that I, I really try to work as as, as much as possible 
you know, to, to the edge of sanity, basically, uh, because the, you know, t Tesla's getting to the point where, uh, probably we'll get to the point later this year, where every good, every high quality minute of thinking um, uh, is a million dollars to, to uh, impact on, on Tesla. So, uh, <laughs> which is insane. Um, so, um, I mean, the basic, you know, if, if, if Tesla is doing, you know, of a sort of two billion dollars a week, let's say in revenue, it's sort of three hundred million dollars a day, seven days a week. You know, it, it's if you, if you can change that by five percent in an hour's brainstorm, um, <laughs> that, that those those are yeah. pretty valuable. That's a pretty valuable hour. I mean, there, there, there are many, many instances where uh, a, a half-hour meeting, the or I was able to improve the financial outcome of the company um, by a hundred million dollars in a half-hour meeting. There are many other people out there who 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 can't stand this world of, of of billionaires. Like they they are hugely offended by the notion that an individual can have the same wealth as, as say, a billion of or more of the the world's poorest people. If, if they examine sort of the uh, sort of, I think there's some axiomatic flaws um, that that are leading to them to, to, to that conclusion. If for sure it would be very problematic if I was consuming, uh, you know, billions of dollars a year in, in personal consumption. But that is not the case. Um, in fact, I don't even own a home right now. Um, I'm literally staying at friends' places. I. If I travel to the Bay Area, which is where most of Tesla engineering is, I, I stay in my, I basically rotate through friends' spare bedrooms. Um, I don't have a yacht. I, I really don't take vacations. Uh, so um, it's, not, it's not as though there's, um, that, that my personal consumption is, is high. Uh, with the, I mean, the one exception is a plane, but if I don't use the plane, then I have less hours to work. Mm. <laughs> so. Um, I mean, I, I personally think you have shown that you are mostly driven by a really quite a deep sense of moral purpose. Like you, you've tried yeah. your, 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 your attempts to solve the climate problem have, have been as powerful as anyone else on the planet that I'm aware of. And I actually can't, can't understand, personally, I can't understand the fact that you get all this criticism from the left about, oh my God, he's so rich, that's disgusting. Um, yeah. when, when climate is their issue, um, Philanthropy is, is a topic that some people go to. Philanthropy is a hard topic. Like, how, how do you think about that? Um, I, I think if you, if you care about the reality of goodness instead of the perception of it, philanthropy is extremely difficult. Um, SpaceX, Tesla, Neuralink, and Boring Company are philanthropy. If you say philanthropy is love of humanity, um, they are philanthropy. They're, Tesla is accelerating sustainable energy. This is a love of of Full anthropy. Right. Uh, SpaceX is trying to ensure the long-term survival of humanity with multi-planet species. This is love of humanity. Um, you know, Neuralink is is to help solve uh, brain injuries and uh, existential risk with AI. Love of humanity. Boring Company is trying to solve traffic, which is hell for most people, and uh, th that also is love right. of humanity. It's like the, how how upsetting. Is it to you to hear this constant drumbeat of billionaires? My God, Elon Musk! Oh my God! Like, is it? Do you do you do you just shrug that off, or does it does it actually hurt? I, I mean, at this point, it's water off a duck's back. You know, I'd like to, as, as we wrap up now, just pull the camera back and just think. You're a father now of seven uh -huh. surviving kids and and well I, I mean I'm, I'm trying to set a good example because the birth rate on earth is so low that uh, we're facing civilizational collapse unless the birth rate re re uh, uh, returns to su a, a sustainable level yeah you've talked about this a lot that depopulation is a big problem uh, and we 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 yes people don't understand population collapse population is. is uh one of the biggest threats to the future of human civilization and that is what is going on right now how what what drives you on a day-to-day -day basis to do what you do I guess, the, like, I, I, I really want to make sure that there is a good future for humanity um, and that we're on a path to understanding the nature of the universe, um, the meaning of life, why are we here, how do we get here. Um, and in order to understand the nature of the universe and all these fundamental questions, um, we must expand the scope and scale of consciousness uh, 
certainly it must not diminish or go out, or we, we, we certainly we won't understand this. So I, I would say I'm motivated by curiosity more than anything, um, and uh, just a desire to think about the future and not be sad, you know, and... Um, and, and are you? Are you not sad? I'm sometimes sad, but I, I, mostly I'm, I, I'm, I mean, I'm feeling, I guess, rel relatively optimistic about the future these days. Um, there are certainly um, some big risks that humanity faces. Uh, I think the, the, the population collapse is a really big deal that um, I wish more people would, 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 would think about, because um, the, the birth rate is far below uh, what's needed to sustain civilization at its, cur at its current level. Um, and, uh, you know, there's obviously, um, you know, we, we need to take action on climate sustainability, which is, is, ha is, is being done. Um, and we need to secure the future of consciousness by being a multi-planet species. Um, we, we need to address the, essentially, we, it's important to take whatever actions we can think of to address the existential risks that affect the, the future of, of consciousness. There's a, there's a whole generation coming through who seem really sad about the future. What would you say to them? Well, I think if you want the future to be good, you must make it so. Take action to make it good, and it will be. Elon, thank you for all this time. Um, that is a beautiful place to end. Thanks for all that you're doing. You're welcome.